is an apostate form of Christianity. In other words, it's basically a false gospel or a false religion. You've given six reasons that you believe that. Here they are. Number one, that the Catholic Church preaches a false gospel. That's a strong statement. Number two, that the Catholic Church corrupts the word of God. Number three, that Catholic bishops are actually false apostles. Number four, that Catholic priests are false mediators. Number five, that the Catholic Church engages in idolatry. That's the worship of idols. And number six, that Roman Catholicism usurps the sovereignty of God. I'm going to make you defend every one of those right now. Number one, the Catholic Church preaches a false gospel. Prove it. Well, sure. According to the scripture, we know that the gospel is all about the Lord Jesus Christ. He was the perfect Savior who went to the cross and he died for the sins of those who would put their trust in him. And so he lived a sinless life. He obeyed the law perfectly. He was the only one qualified to die for the sins of his people. And so by going to the cross, he was immersed in the wrath of God. And he paid the complete sin debt that sinners deserve. And he called out in the end, it is finished. But the Roman Catholic Church denies that. The Catholic Church declares that Jesus is an insufficient Savior. And so whenever you have an insufficient Savior, you need another gospel to instruct people what they must do. And so what, that's what the Catholic Church does. They have another gospel. And it all begins with the sacrament of baptism. You must be baptized. That's the sacrament of regeneration and justification. Then later on, you have to receive the sacraments. That's part of um, your requirement to get to heaven. You also need to attend the sacrifice of the mass. You also need to keep the law. And that's interesting, Costi, because According to James chapter 2, verse 10, if you were to keep the law perfectly and yet fail at one part, you've committed, broken the whole law. And so it's impossible for anyone to keep the law perfectly. In fact, in Galatians 3, it says that if you try, you're under a curse. And so one of the requirements of the Catholic gospel is to keep the law perfectly. And so you've added all these requirements to the gospel and you look back to Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 to 9, and there you see the Judaizers coming into town, and they're saying, hey, we believe in Jesus, but if you're a Gentile, you not only need to believe, but you need to be circumcised. So what did Paul do? Did he say, let's have unity with these brothers who profess Christ? He said, no, let them be anathema. Let them be turned over to God for destruction. And so you look at the Catholic Church and the requirements they have put forth in order to be saved baptism, good works, the sacraments, keeping the law, the sacrifice of the mass. They're under divine condemnation, those who preach a false and fatal gospel. So by the authority of scripture, we can say that the Roman Catholic Church has a false gospel that is under divine condemnation. Mike, number two, you say the Catholic Church corrupts the word of God. And here's what you say. The Bible issues a stern warning to anyone who would add to the word of God. And then you even quote Proverbs, do not add to his words, lest he rebuke you and you be found a liar. I'm reminded of even in the book of Revelation, the warning about adding and subtracting from God's word. How does the Catholic Church do that? Well, according to the Catechism of the Catholic Church, they have added their tradition to be the very word of God. And so they completely go against what's read in Proverbs 30. And by doing that, they've corrupted the Word of God. There's warnings throughout Scripture, do not add or take away from the Word of God. But the Catholic Church does not submit to the authority of Scripture. And so by doing so, they've corrupted the Word of God. Really clear. What about the Apocrypha in that? Is that also a man-made addition or insertion, which then would brazenly trample upon the Word of God? Sure, the Apocrypha was added at the Council of Trent, and they did so in order to try and justify the selling of indulgences to get people out of a place called purgatory. And what they found in 2 Maccabees was that during the Maccabean revolt, they had dead soldiers wearing pagan amulets around their neck. And so they sent alms back to Jerusalem for the repose of their soul. And so Catholics grabbed a hold of that at the Council of Trenton and added it to their canon in, in hopes that people would say, see, the Jews did it. Therefore, it's biblical. 
Well, of course, we don't do things just because the Jews did things. After all, they rejected Christ as their Messiah. So it was a false practice by the Jews and also a false practice by the Catholic Church. Very well said. Mike, you also say, third, Catholic bishops are false apostles. And you say that because Rome teaches that its bishops have, by divine institution, taken the place of the apostles as the pastors of the church. And you're quoting the uh, Catholic catechism, I believe. Why do you say that Catholic leaders, their bishops, are false apostles? Well, again, we go to Scripture as our authority, and we see in Acts chapter 1, verses 21 to 23, when Judas committed suicide, the 11 remaining apostles got together and chose Matthias. He had to be an eyewitness to the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. That was a qualification in order to be a successor of the apostles. Well, there's only been two successors. You had Matthias, and then God also chose Paul, who was also an eyewitness. So by the authority of Scripture, we can say Roman Catholic bishops are not qualified. They were not eyewitnesses to the resurrection of Christ. Well said. Is there some contradiction there even as well where uh, the Pope in his position is a sort of apostle but the bishops are apostles as well? Or is that not related? Well, all the bishops are said to be successors of the apostles. And so after you're a bishop, then you get promoted to cardinal and one of the cardinals becomes Pope. So they're all quote unquote successors of the apostles. And the Pope would be considered maybe a sort of Peter, the first among equals, if you will. That's right. Chosen out of that group. He's also considered um, the head of the church, which we know that he did not shed his blood to purchase the church. That was the Lord Jesus, who was the only head of the church. Mike, the fourth reason that you consider the Roman Catholic Church an apostate church is that Catholic priests are false mediators. Explain how they're false mediators. Well, the Bible says there is only one mediator between God and man. That's the man Christ Jesus, 1 Timothy 2, verse 5. And so Roman Catholics are told they must go through the priest in order to confess their sins. And so he is a mediator between God and man. The Roman Catholic Church also has another sinless mediator. Her name is Mary. And many Roman Catholic women prefer to go through Mary rather than through Christ in order to obtain favor from God. And so the Roman Catholic priest and even Roman Catholic saints are said to be places that Catholics can pray to as other mediators between them and God. Mike, paragraph 1367 of the Roman Catholic Catechism says this, the sacrifice of Christ and the sacrifice of the Eucharist are one single sacrifice. The victim is one and the same. In this divine sacrifice, the same Christ who offered himself once in a bloody manner on the altar of the cross is contained and is offered in an unbloody manner. You say that because of a statement like that, the Roman Catholic Church is engaging in idolatry. How is that idolatry? Well, by the authority of Scripture, we can say that that's not the true Christ. It's an imposter. It's a counterfeit Christ because... In Hebrews 9.28, it says Jesus will return a second time. The Catholic Church teaches that the priest has the power to call Almighty God, the Lord Jesus Christ, down from heaven to continue on an altar what he finished on the cross. And so when the priest lifts up the Eucharist for Catholics to worship it, that's idolatry because it's a false Christ. And after the Catholics worship this Eucharist as their Savior, the priest lays it on the altar to be offered up as a victim. Christ was never a victim. He went to the cross willingly. And so the Catholic Church denies the finished work of Christ, calling him back down from heaven every day to continue what he finished on the cross. Mike, you say that the Roman Catholic Church usurps the sovereignty of God. You write, the Roman Catholic priests are said to do what only the sovereign Lord can do, and that is raise spiritually dead people to life. Rome teaches, through baptism, we are freed from sin and reborn as sons of God. Baptism is the sacrament of regeneration through water in the word. And that's paragraph 1213 of the Roman Catholic Catechism. Why do you take such an issue with the way the Roman Catholic Church views salvation in that regard? Basically because of what we read in John chapter 3, that regeneration is a sovereign work of the Holy Spirit. 
And that's where you have Nicodemus and the Lord Jesus dealing with this whole subject of regeneration. And Jesus says it's like the wind. You don't know where it's coming from or where it's going, but you must be born again. You must be regenerated. If you back up in, into John chapter 1, you see that it's the work of God, not of man. But the Roman Catholic priests say they have the power to regenerate a dead soul, which is normally an infant, seven-day-old infant, by sprinkling efficacious waters over the baby. And so that is said to be the sacrament of regeneration, where the infant is now born again, a child of God. But later on, that child can commit a mortal sin and end up in hell. And so when the Roman Catholic Church regenerates an infant through the sacrament, they must maintain a sinless life that is without mortal sin in order to remain born again. It's usurping the sovereign work of the Holy Spirit because only God can bring forth those who are dead in their sin. We see in even in Titus chapter 3 verse 5 that, that we are, it's because of God's mercy, not because of righteous things we have done. And it's the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit who washes us clean. And so the Roman Catholic Church again opposes the Word of God, opposes the sovereignty of God by daring to say that the priests have that power to bring those who are dead in sin to a life in Christ.